Hello, good afternoon. Um, we're going over the period of time known as early modern Japan and China. This is chapter 21 in your textbook. And it's broken up so I do Japan first and then I do China second. And for Japan, I'm going to start in the 1400s. Um, it's important to understand the development of modern Japan by seeing where Japan's coming from. From 1467 to 1615, there's this period of constant warfare and this period of constant anarchy that really disrupts all of Japanese society. And it's known as the Warring States era. At this time, the country is run by an emperor, but the emperor is going to be replaced by a warlord known as a shogun. Uh, below the shogun are lords known as daimyo, and these feudal lords, they own the land that peasants worked on. Now, controlled by the daimyo are samurai, and these samurai are elite soldiers who are going to serve as the backbone of the Japanese military, and the samurai, they are loyal to their individual lords. Now, in the beginning of the Warring States era, the, the um, shogun at the time was part of the Ashikaga shogunate, and the shogun during the Ashikaga shogunate, they never got control of all those lords, they never got control of all the daimyo, and some of these daimyo would occasionally fight against the government. Well, by the time we get to the 1460s, the Ashikaga shogunate is collapsing and more people are willing to fight for control of the country. At the same time this is going on, there's increased trade with China and there's a greater desire for local autonomy. And this period of warning of warring states, 150 years or so, it doesn't end until the rise of three uniters, Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. Now let's start with this first person. His name is Oda Nob Nobunaga. And he's going to be in control of, of Japan from 1578 to 1582. Now Oda Nobunaga, he was the head of the powerful Oda clan, and he was the most powerful lord in the late 1500s. Uh, he's seen really as the first great unifier in Japanese history. And in 1573, Nobunaga, he's going to challenge the then shogun Ashikaga Yoshiaki and beat the shogun's army in battle. And this is going to drive Yoshiaki from the capital city of Kyoto. Now that officially ends the Ashikaga shogunate, and Nobunaga is given the power to control and run the government by the emperor. After gaining the support of the emperor, Nobunaga is going to continue to challenge other daimyo who stand up against him, and he's going to have his Oda clan challenge other clans for control of Japan. Now, Nobunaga, he's going to commit a ritualistic suicide known as seppuku uh, after he is surrounded by enemy forces inside a temple. And if you're not familiar with what's with seppuku is, you take your samurai sword and you fillet yourself open so your innards are then outards and you die. After Oda Nobunaga dies, uh, power is going to move on to Toyotomo uh, Hideyoshi. And Toyotomi uh, Hideyoshi, he's originally a peasant, but he eventually rises up to become the second in command underneath Nobunaga. And after the death of Oda Nobunaga, he's going to continue to unite Japan. Once he has control of the government, he initiates something known as the Great Sword Hunt, which required samurai to prove that they were from noble descent. If a samurai could not prove their nobility, if they could not prove their wealth, then they were disarmed, they had to give up their sword, and they were forced back into being peasantry. And this great sword hunt, as it becomes known, is going to disarm about 95% of all the samurai. And 95% of all the samurai are forced to become peasants. Those samurai that are left basically become pencil pushers and government officials. Following the great sword hunt, Hideyoshi is going to attempt to freeze the social classes. 
He is going to prohibit samurai from quitting the services of their lords and becoming a, a samurai uh, that's going to become, like I said, a government job, basically. Now, some of the things Hideyoshi does in 1592, he invades Korea. Uh, he doesn't win in Korea. He is defeated there, and his reputation is damaged forever. Also in 1592, Hideyoshi dies, and he left a young son named Hideyori, who was supposed to become the new shogun. But Hideyori was like four or five years old and couldn't rule. Well, a regency, um, people who would rule in Hideyori's name was formed. And the two advisors of this regency was a guy named Tokugawa Ieyasu and another guy named Ishida Mitsunari. They're both going to serve as advisors to the child shogun. Very quickly, Tokugawa Ieyasu, he's going to begin to seize more and more power from Ishida Mitsunari and from Hideyori. Eventually, this power grab by Tokugawa Ieyasu is going to be challenged by the other daimyo. And that leads us to October 21st, 1600, and something known as the Battle of Sekigahara. So this Battle of Sekigahara, this is like the culmination of the disagreement between these two regions, Tokugawa Ieyasu and Ishida Mitsunari. So you have the, the samurai and the army of the Tokugawa clan, which was the most powerful clan, versus the army and the samurai of the Ishida clan, which was the second most powerful. Um, during the battle, Ieyasu, he's going to make a deal with some of Mitsunari's allies. And uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, he's going to offer these allies land in exchange for switching sides. And during the battle, a few of these allies do change sides, which leads to a victory for Tokugawa Ieyasu. After the battle is won by Tokugawa Ieyasu, um, he's going to become the new shogun, and this becomes known as the Tokugawa era, which lasts all the way from 1603 all the way to 1868. Some of the things that Tokugawa Ieyasu is going to do He's going to reorganize Japan. He's going to move the capital from the city of Osaka to the city of Edo. Edo today is known better as Tokyo. He confiscated the lands from his defeated enemies and redistributed them. And he moved the lords or the, he moved the daimyo around so that those who were his closest allies were closest to his land. Basically, he used them as meat shields or protection. Tokugawa Ieyasu, he's also going to continue the sword hunt. He's going to further limit the number of people who could be a samurai. Social changes are going to happen. Uh, daimyo are only allowed to marry or repair their castles with permission of Tokugawa Ieyasu. The wives and children of these daimyo are required to live in Edo. And the daimyo themselves are required to live in Edo every other year. New laws are passed to control courts, temples, shrines, and the daimyo themselves. And many of these laws are based on loyalty and honor. A national policy of seclusion is adopted in 1630 by Tokugawa Ieyasu's son. And this policy of seclusion, it bans foreigners other than Chinese and Dutch from visiting Japan completely. And this policy of seclusion is going to be forcefully observed from 1860 all the way until 1854. The Tokugawa economy, um, the Tokugawa period, it's this long period of peace and seclusion. Uh, there's not a lot happening, but there are problems that develop. Like by 1700, the economy, it's approached its limits because of population increases and the people of Japan are forced to start using either contraception or infanticide, which was the 
purposeful killing of infants to control population increase. Uh, there was a strong internal market. Commerce was flowing throughout Japan, but very little industrialization. And without industrialization, uh, the Japanese economy was very limited. Eventually, just because the system starts to break down, the Japanese economy slows to a halt. And there's not a whole lot of change in Japan between 1700 and the 1850s at all. Now, the other half of the equation is China. And with Chinese history, we think of it in terms of dynasties. And these are going to be the last two dynasties in Chinese history. Uh, you have the Ming Dynasty. And it rules from 1368 to 1644. And then you have the Qing Dynasty that rules from 1644 to 1911. During the period of the Ming and the Qing emperors the influence of the mongol empire is slowly lessened uh, it's completely eradicated through government policies and china becomes ruled by uh, chinese culture chinese government chinese laws again um, the chinese are going to conquer taiwan they're going to expand the influence into central asia uh, which is interesting because these earliest Ming emperors, they believed in isolationism. Um, it was mostly keep to ourselves and their economy was almost completely based on agriculture. But by the time we get to the mid 1600s, that's changing because there's more and more European influence. There's a rise in population. The government policies start to relax because they have to keep up with all these changes. One of the biggest changes that happen are these private banks known as Shanxi banks that open throughout China. Uh, these are going to be banks owned by wealthy merchant families. They're used to facilitate trade throughout the area. Uh, they lend money and extend credit to people throughout China. And eventually these Shangxi banks, they get so big and so important that they spread to places like Singapore, Japan, and even Russia. Most of the growth that's going on in China is going to be in market towns, these intermediate sized towns that link the big cities to the small agricultural villages. Um, family structure is very much based on Confucian traditions. Women were expected to obey men. Men knew their place in society and everybody followed the rules. Women were physically restricted and this idea and this practice known as foot binding became common. And if you've never looked up foot binding before, go ahead and take a second to do it. It's pretty gross. Education in China is extremely important because the only way to get a job in the government was to pass a civil service exam. So education was all about passing the civil service exam and the civil service exam was the way that you got higher up in Chinese society. Now, both the Ming and the, Sh and the Qing dynasties, they have strong government, they have strong competent emperors the emperor allowed his administration to run the government. He focused mainly on cultural and religious things. And he was able to do that because these civil service exams gave only the best people government positions. Now, the way that the education and the civil service exams worked together, uh, the education was based on the teachings of Confucius. Uh, you would have a candidate screened at a local office, then they would take a county exam. If the county civil service exam was passed, then they could become a member of the gentry, the, the middle class uh, gentlemen's club, and they would be eligible to take the provincial exam. Now, the provincial exam was given once every three years, so you had three years to study from, from one exam to the next. If you pass the provincial exam, then you could pass the metropolitan exam, which was also given only once every three years. 
So you have another three years to study. Beginning with the basic local test going all the way up to the national metropolitan test, fewer than 90 people would pass all three tests and work in the government. China and Europe were connected together. Europeans first come to China in large numbers in the 1500s. Some of these Europeans come as missionaries and the Jesuits, remember the stormtroopers of the Pope, are involved with this. There's a guy named Matteo Ricci uh, who masters the Chinese language and he shares the knowledge of Western math and science with the Chinese while the Jesuits including Matteo Ricci, are going to compare the philosophies of Jesus to the philosophies of Confucius. And he's going to say, look, these two guys would have gotten along perfectly fine. It's okay to believe in one and the other at the same time. Um, the Jesuits are even holding Catholic services in the native Chinese language. Eventually, the missionaries complain about the Chinese language services and they complain about this practice known as ancestor worship and the Pope is going to order the Jesuits to stop the Chinese language services and stop allowing ancestor worship to happen. When that occurs, the guy who was emperor at the time, Kang Shi, orders an end to the preaching of Christianity in China and China tries to get rid of Christianity. There were other Europeans allowed. It wasn't just the Jesuits. Uh, there were trading restrictions in China to keep the Europeans out of the interior. And these trading restrictions were known as the Canton system. And the only city where Europeans could trade was the city of Canton. Any other trade within China by Europeans was considered illegal. And Europeans, specifically the British East India Trading Company, are going to trade for tea and they're going to trade for silk and they're going to give gold and silver to the Chinese merchants, which makes China fairly well financed. All right, that's it for the lectures. I want to pull up the syllabus schedule real quick just so you can see where we are. This week, we're on chapter 21. You've got your discussion seven and your chapter 21 quiz due on Tuesday the 4th. For the week after that, we talk about the American Revolution and we talk about the French Revolution. And on the 11th, your chapter 22 quiz, your discussion eight will be due, and then your second reflection paper. For your second reflection paper, I want you to go ahead and start thinking about it now. You can use any of the documents in week five, six, seven, or eight. I don't want you going back any further than that. I don't want you going ahead. There's some good stuff in lessons five, six, seven, eight that you can use, or weeks five, six, seven, eight, if you want to call it that. The rules for this reflection paper are exactly the same as the first one. A paragraph of summary and then about a page to a page and a half double spaced on your thoughts, opinions, ideas of what you read. After that, and I'll send you out an email here in the next week or so, October 12th is the midterm exam. It will be proctored, meaning that you will have to use either the respondents lockdown browser or you'll have to come in person to a West Georgia Technical College location to one of our libraries to do the proctoring exam. Uh, if you're not familiar with Respondus, uh, you cannot use it on a Chromebook. It doesn't work very well on an Apple product, but it will work. Um, if you have a Chromebook, you may want to make plans to take it in a library. If you have an iMac or an or a, um, Apple laptop, something like that, you may you can try it on Respondus. It may work, it may not. Um, basically, just telling you that you don't need to wait till the last minute to take your exam, because if you find out you need to take it in one of our library locations, we're not open on the weekends. But I'll send you out an email with more information on that midterm next week. 
All right, until next time, any questions, send me an email. I like hearing from you. We'll talk to you later. Bye.